The teams have been split and they all know what to do to attack the Tree of Wisdom, Entropy, Mystery, and Wonder. But can they pull it out? I'm Stan and this is Detail Comics. What's up, everybody? This is an IRA review, a show where I go over a comic book, its story, its art, give you my impressions, and let you know whether it's something you should go back to the comic book shop for or not. Make sure you subscribe to get more of these every single week. The book that I want to talk about right now is Justice League No Justice Number 3, which is a continuation of the four-part miniseries by Scott Snyder, Joshua Williamson, and James Tyne IV. So this is the third part in that series, and what we're dealing with is the Omega Titans. Currently, we have the Justice League, as well as a bunch of other different members of the Titans, the Teen Titans, and a few other different villains that are kind of matched up by Brainiac to try and solve the problem and save Kolu before it has a chance to kind of be consumed by these Omega Titans. The four cosmic trees are in play, and the teams are ready to to try and enact their plans, but will they be successful? Let's dive into the story and see what kind of results they get. After the events of No Justice 2, what needs to happen inside No Justice 3 has become explicitly clear. We have our teams of entropy, wisdom, wonder, and mystery that are all at their respective trees and they're kind of coming up with these various strategies as to how to take them on. But when we focus on these individual stories, these individual teams, we see that mystery is still trying to deal with the aspect of tens of thousands of worlds being unleashed on the universe. We see that entropy, they're actually confronting Brainiac 2.0, trying to decipher exactly what's going on with the entire of Kolu, as well as exactly what's going to be happening. And what Brainiac, what Viral Dox tells these team members for Entropy is that there is no point in time where Brainiac was not a critical point in the plan that he had to save Kolu and possibly dominate the universe. This is one of those things where when he starts explaining the concept, it makes so much sense inside the strategy of Brainiac. Uh, what he's going to do is these nodes that were on these suits for all these different superheroes were meant to absorb the powers and the energies of the cosmic trees, funneling them into Brainiac, and overall allowing him to dominate the planet Kolu and dispose of some of the greatest heroes of Earth at the same time, so that that way he could march unopposed across the rest of the universe. However, back in the Arctic Circle, we still see the confrontation between Amanda Waller and Oliver Queen's Green Arrow, and they're sitting in front of the world seed that has been excited, it has been enhanced, it has been jump-started by Brainiac. Apparently, at his time of death, it was triggered to reignite this world seed that is going to draw the Omega Titans to planet Earth. Oliver Queen wants to call out to Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns. Amanda Waller, she's going to drop the largest nuclear weapon that she possibly can onto this place and pray that that's enough. But that puts him into some sort of Mexican standoff. As we jump back to Kolu and we see Team Wonder taking on the Tree of Wonder, these spirits that have been long dormant on this planet are kind of up and fighting against these various characters. Their powers, their magic has been dampened by the suits of Brainiac, but that leaves one person, one person that is filled with wonder herself, and that is Wonder Woman, blessed by the god Odds. She takes her lasso, wraps it around the base of the tree, and while Zaytana and Etrigan might have some concerns about the strength of her magic, Raven thinks that it might just be for the best to put their faith in Wonder Woman, to put their faith in Diana, as she calls out for Wonder and this blast of energy radiates from the Tree of Wonder, reigniting it. It's alive, it's back in the game. But if only the other teams could be so lucky. Cyborg starts to jack into the central databanks, downloading the entirety of the history of Kolu, bringing everything, everybody's AI, all the information into this he sees various aspects of what the society understands regarding the situation, the world seed that he's got to pull, the original seed that was planted on this planet ages ago for the Omega Titans to grow and feed from. Unfortunately, with a planet of this size, so many people, so much information, it's overwhelming for him, even though he's Cyborg 1 million from this whole Dark Knight's Metal saga, but that's beside the point. It seems like it's just far too much. And then we get a transition, not only in characters and team, but in art style. The first half of this book was done by Riley Rosmo, and the second one is done by Marcus Toe, and the contrast between the art styles couldn't be more clear. It's actually kind of jarring. But what Mystery is trying to do is they're trying to ignite their tree. Cyborg is trying to drain every bit of energy he can out of the Tree of Wisdom, and Entropy is currently blossoming, according to what Batman's readings say. So that only leaves Mystery to try and kind of balance out these powers. But there's no way to unleash 10,000 worlds right on the planet of Kolu. You've got to find a, some sort of space where they can actually actually be, but that is something that they can't necessarily deal with right now. What they have to do is they have to go over to the Omega Titan and try to take it down, try to stop it, give it pause, so that that way they have the time that they need to reignite the Tree of Mystery. But that leads to some last minute desperation tactics. As all these kind of members of these various teams jump into the fray, we see Starro call out to Adam, asking him to feed him some of that dwarf star energy, and he grows. He starts growing from the size of the giant starfish that we see now to something gigantic 
frantic and he just latches onto the face of the Omega Titan and he's just it's such a cool moment for Starro he's written so amazing it's like I have conquered worlds upon worlds your puny mind is no match for me as he tries to dominate this gigantic cosmic being that existed since the beginning of time this is just such a cool thing and it's one of those moments that you're only going to find in a story like Justice League No Justice. Unfortunately for Starro, it doesn't end well as the Omega Titan reaches up to its face, grabs the various pieces of him, and just tears him asunder. So there's nothing left. There's nothing left of Starro as the Omega Titan dismantles and starts to wrap itself around the planet Kolu, and it eats the thing alive. The inhabitants of planet Kolu no longer exist as they try and escape from this planet that has been devoured by the Omega Titan, the skull ship of Brainiac, making its way out into space, and the fate of Earth is now in its darkest hour. While we've got this Mexican standoff as Green Arrow fires an arrow into the barrel of Amanda Waller's gun, we see the arrival of the various trees showing up in places like Star Labs, Bell Reeve Penitentiary, the Tower of Fate, the home of Dr. Fate, and then of course the Fortress of Solitude. That's the end of Justice League No Justice Number 3, with Omega Titans bearing down on planet Earth, Oliver Queen and Amanda Waller, the only ones really knowing exactly what's going on, and a dead ship of Brainiac housing the heroes of the Justice League and various other teams floating in space, leaving us to be continued inside issue number four. Again, Justice League No Justice is a very convoluted story that has a lot of moving components, but it's really driven by the spectacle and putting together all these pieces to try and form some sort of cohesive narrative that is going to determine the future of the DCU itself. And Scott Snyder, Joshua Williamson, and James Tynan, they're doing a fantastic job trying to push this forward and create this mythology out of nothingness, out of space. And I'm really excited about that. The biggest drawback for No Justice number three for me is Riley Rosmo's art at the beginning. Compared to Francis Manipal's art in the first two issues, Rosmo for the first 12 pages of this just doesn't necessarily carry the kind of weight. It feels so off in comparison to Toe's art and to Manipal that you can't help but feel shocked by the actual change in art style. It just doesn't necessarily jive with this overall series, at least in my perspective. But I wouldn't say that it attracts too much for me. So overall, I think the No Justice number three is a very good part of this series, and I think it's going to read better in an overall four issue mini, like a little trade paperback, plus some complimentary pieces. But I want to know what you guys think too, so hit me up in the comments down below and we can start that conversation. As always, if you like what you see, hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe to get more news, reviews, and commentary on comic books, comic book movies, comic book TV shows, and games, and anything and everything inside the world of comics.